Long COVID, a phenomenon which is still puzzling researchers around the world. Many people who were infected with COVID-19 have had long-term problems after recovering, even if they weren't very ill in the first place. The list of symptoms is long and wide-ranging. Extreme tiredness, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, chest pain, and problems with memory and concentration. Many also are afflicted with chronic pain. The severity of symptoms varies, but many have been left unable to deal with everyday challenges like cleaning, grocery shopping, and they report problems communicating. Treating long COVID patients requires doctors to take into account both physical and psychological symptoms, and to sometimes consider experimental treatment, like recuperation in salt mines. This is your COVID-19 special on DW. I'm Janelle Dumalaon. What exactly causes long COVID? In this next report, we meet someone who has it and examine the theories as to why she's experiencing it. Have a look. You can't tell by looking at her, but every one of her movements takes immense strength. For a year now, Jennifer Nails can hardly do anything on her own. She has chronic fatigue syndrome after COVID-19. I've never felt this exhausted before in my life. I actually need hours to get dressed, to wash myself. I constantly have to lie down and rest in between. Every couple of minutes, her body forces her to stop and rest. Even during our interview, the 43-year-old needs to take breaks over and over. For years now, Carmen Scheibenborgen and her team at Charité Berlin University of Medicine are among the few researchers studying chronic fatigue syndrome. The scientists are familiar with the symptoms, which are similar to those of infectious mononucleosis. Not everyone who has COVID-19 and developed long COVID also shows signs of chronic fatigue syndrome. It's only a possible consequence. Researchers currently have three hypotheses on how and why CFS develops. First, the immune hypothesis. The immune system gets confused. It wants to fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but overshoots permanently. There's a constant overreaction in the blood vessels. Too many antibodies and T cells on a continuous basis. When the immune system is hard at work, we feel exhausted. Everyone's familiar with the symptoms, from pain to lack of concentration and other typical flu-like symptoms. All that can come from the immune system. So the immune or autoimmune hypothesis can explain the whole clinical pattern. Second, the blood circulation hypothesis. The blood vessels in the body become inflamed, right down to the smallest veins. They can no longer properly dilate and constrict. The blood circulation is disturbed, which even affects the mitochondria, the cell's tiny powerhouses. The result is that organs and muscles cannot function optimally and become weak. If the vessels are not supplied with blood, then there won't be enough oxygen in the tissues, which in turn means the body can't produce enough energy. This can quickly result in muscle pain during exertion, headaches and concentration loss. Third, the nervous system hypothesis. In this case, researchers believe that the nerves cannot properly function. There's limited conductivity. The nervous system, which also controls unconscious bodily functions, is under constant stress. And that leads to dysfunction in the entire body. The nervous system is no longer functional. The most typical example is the loss of taste and smell, which is also a function of the nerves, but also memory loss and problems with concentration. Scientists believe that these three mechanisms, separately or together, could trigger chronic fatigue syndrome. But because so little research has been done, it's still hard for doctors to know how to effectively help patients like Jennifer Nails. David Strain is a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Welcome back to the program. 
David, you have experienced long COVID yourself. We last talked about that earlier this year. How are you doing now? Um, I'm doing much better. Um, I'm still not 100%, but I'm fully functional at work. Um, I still do wake up with a pain. I still do get tired a lot quicker than I used to do, but on the most part, making a pretty good recovery. Certainly glad to hear that. But you said back then that the natural history was not clear yet. Do we know more now? We are getting more and more data as to the people who are making a full recovery versus the people who are making partial recovery versus the people who are not getting better at all. And at the moment, the numbers appear to be a third of each. So a third of people who get this seem to make a full recovery, back to normal, no residual symptoms. A third of people make good enough recovery so that they can go about their activities as usual, they go back to work, they spend time with the kids as normal. Um, and then there's a third of people that do appear to be um, still suffering very badly 12 or now 15 or 16 months after their original infection. Now, one of the hypotheses about the causes of long COVID is that it's in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cells, an area in which you are doing research, of course. Can you tell us about your findings there? Um, it's very early to say things for definite. We are seeing some evidence that um, actually in the report earlier, you were talking about the autoantibodies, and there is some evidence of the autoantibodies that are actually targeting uh, mitochondria. Uh, and there does appear to be an overlap that the mitochondria are not reproducing as well. And that fits very much with some of the patients or the, the profile of some of the patients who present with this, that they are um, uh, starting the day feeling OK. They just re um, fatigue very, very quickly. And the interplay between these autoimmune and mitochondria does appear to be a big factor. That is actually really promising because if we can clarify exactly how that's happening, it does open itself to treatments that are actually treating the cause, rather than at the moment we are very much dealing with the symptoms. Now, chronic fatigue syndrome, of course, a part of long COVID. Is that the worst manifestation of long COVID that one can get? Well, there are many different manifestations, and actually there are some people whose fatigue isn't that bad, but are presented with lots of chest pains or lots of palpitations. But for many, 91% uh, of people who get long COVID are uh, troubled by this fatigue. And the fatigue itself can be incredibly debilitating. Actually, the name chronic fatigue syndrome doesn't do justice, but just how bad these people are experiencing it. Um, as in your report, there are people who just can't do simple tasks. Um, the idea of chopping some carrots has to be done in multiple stages. Uh, and for those, the worst bit about it is there is no visual recognition. Um, if they had uh, big cuts, if they had big rashes, if they had something that you can say, yes, this is the problem, it's much easier to, uh, to address that. Whereas because the fatigue, there's no way of measuring it, there's no way of observing it, there's no real test for it, then people very often struggle to have the, the severity of their condition recognised. David Strain is a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Up next, Derek Williams with one of your questions on long COVID. What do we know about the reduction in long COVID risk by vaccines? The data shows that vaccines very clearly help save lives and, and spare nearly all recipients from the worst ravages of, of COVID-19. But do they also reduce the chances of developing possible long-term effects in the weeks or the months after you should have recovered. Um, at least one in 10 people have those. And, and we know from studies that even those who have mild symptoms initially can go on to develop what's called long COVID, which is a wide range of, of chronic complaints linked to infection with SARS-CoV-2 that, that for unclear reasons uh, persist in some people. 
Uh, knowing whether vaccines could also help prevent long COVID from developing has therefore been a very pressing question, uh, not just in terms of the potential human cost, but, but also because long COVID looks set to have a huge impact on national healthcare systems all over the planet in years to come. So if vaccines could help prevent not just serious initial disease, but also the development of, of long COVID and breakthrough cases, then, then that would be a really huge bonus. Um, and on Wednesday, researchers published evidence that they likely do. Uh, the major study led by scientists at King's College in London um, looked at information registered via an app by millions of adults in Britain, um, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, in roughly the first six months of this year. And it found that in people who'd been vaccinated, but later tested positive for COVID-19 anyway, the chances of having symptoms for four weeks or more after infection, so long COVID, were only around half that in unvaccinated people. Now, that's not necessarily the last word on the topic, but it is a strong indicator that vaccines don't just help prevent serious disease. They also probably go a long way towards keeping people who have breakthrough infections from developing long COVID. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and see you again soon.